Happy Mother's Day. Welcome back to the Community Presbyterian Church in downtown Pismo Beach. We are so thankful for all the moms out there today. God bless you. And this service is around a tribute to all moms. I have a, a poem for you, a very brief poem called Mother's Love, which I would like to use for our peace candle reading today. You'll see the peace candle is burning over my shoulder. A Mother's Love, dedicated to all the moms watching today. Her love is like an island in life's ocean, vast and wide, a peaceful, quiet shelter from the wind, the rain, the tide. Tis bound on the north by hope, by patience on the west, by tender counsel on the south, and on the east by rest. Above it, like a beacon light, shine faith and truth and prayer. And through the changing scenes of life, I find a haven there. Friends, thanks be to God for all our moms. Amen. Now, friends, I have our scripture lesson for Mother's Day today. And the first lesson I'm reading from the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Let us listen together for the word of God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, one day. Thanks be to God for this reading. Our second lesson is one verse from uh, the book of Proverbs, chapter 22, and I'm going to read verse 6. Let us listen together for the word of God. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Thanks be to God for this reading. Amen. Here now is my communion meditation for Mother's Day. Last month, Suzanne, April, and I took a trip to the Bay Area to visit the campus of UC Berkeley. My daughter, April, will begin her freshman year there this August. One of many awesome sites we saw on campus was Sather Gate. Sather Gate is a historical landmark for the city of Berkeley and the university. The gate was designed by the campus architect, John Galen Howard, and was a gift from Jane Sather in 1913 in memory of her husband, Peter Sather, a trustee of the College of California, the forerunner of the university. Sather Gate is part of the historic Sproul Plaza, a major center for student activity that housed many protests throughout the free speech movement of the mid-1960s. The gate is truly amazing. Four granite pillars support the central arch and two side arches of a gate. The arches are ornately ornamented cast bronze with a green patina. Students pass through the gate walking under the arch overhead. The gate's center design uh, on the arch highlights Berkeley's trademark motto, Fiat Lux, a Latin phrase which is translated, let there be light, or let light be made. It also is the motto of the entire University of California system, all the schools, part of that system. After I took April's picture as she stood in front of Sather Gate last month, I was filled with emotions at the thought 
of my mom, Alice Crouch, passing through that gate countless times when she was a student at Berkeley back in the late 1950s. I thought of how proud my mom would have been of her granddaughter, April, soon to embark on her pursuit of an education there. My mom, Alice, believed that education was the key to becoming a person who can carry out the command of the Hebrew prophet Micah, who said that we are to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. My mom embraced that motto, fiat lux, let there be light, for she believed education could help move a person, a nation, from darkness to light. That Latin phrase, fiat lux, was derived from the words in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, which I just read, wherein God said, let there be light, and spoke the world into existence. According to an article I read this past week by Rabbi Aidan Steinsaltz of the Jerusalem Post, entitled, The Motif of Light in Jewish Tradition, Light is the genesis, the creation of the world. Says Rabbi Steinsaltz, the primary utterance of creation is let there be light, its separation from darkness. The Midrash, an ancient commentary on Hebrew scriptures, it asked, from what was light created? The answer is whispered. God cloaked, cloaked himself in a white shawl and the light of its splendor shone from one end of the world to the other. Rabbi Steinsaltz continues, in other words, fundamentally, light does not belong to this world. Rather, it is an emanation of a different essence from the other side of reality, from the divine. Light serves as the symbol of good and of the beautiful, of all that is positive. Rabbi Steinsaltz concludes, light as a positive symbol is so prevalent in biblical Hebrew that redemption, truth, justice, peace, and even life itself shine. And their revelation is expressed in terms of the revelation of light. Friends, the Hebrew Bible in the book of Proverbs offers this truth to parents. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he or she is old, he or she will not depart from it. In other words, take the time to educate your child in the ways of God. For in so doing, they learn how the light of God transforms the world. In a world with the darkness of racism, instill in your children the light of God's love for all human beings. My friends, in a world with the darkness of vengeance, teach them the light of God's call to forgive. In a world with the darkness of violence, introduce your children to the light of God's peace. In a world with the darkness of ignorance, instill in your child the light of God's call to seek wisdom through education, or oh, train up a child in the way he or she should go, and when they were old, they will never depart from it. On this Mother's Day weekend, I'm so thankful to have been raised by a mother who strived to do all that and more. My mom felt it was vital that my brother Peter and I both receive that we receive both the light of religious education in the church and the light of public school education. Both are vital. Mom believed that the light we receive from a religious and a secular education would enable us to be faithful to Christ's call, to, see, to let our light shine so that people would see our good works and give thanks to God in heaven. Now, no longer a child, but a person now in my 60s, I strive to be true to my mom's desire for me to hear Christ's command and then to let my light shine. 
That's my call as a pastor, and it's your call as a follower of Jesus Christ. And letting my light shine today for me includes speaking up against the darkness of intolerance, homophobia, fear, partisan lies, and white nationalism, and speaking up for the light of justice, peace, unity, and love. For the last 21 years, I have strived as a parent to raise my children with the values, the lessons that my mother raised me, so they too will let their light shine today and into their old age. I can't think of a better mother that my children could have had than Suzanne. For Suzanne was there from cradle till today, instilling them God's call to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly in this world, to walk humbly with their God. I want to close with a brief story that you could call Fiat Lux between a mother and son. For in this story, Anne Lamott, a best-selling author, mom, formerly a Presbyterian Sunday school teacher, she describes a day in her life when she and her son Sam moved from the darkness of anger and frustration to the light of forgiving love. Anne Lamott writes, The day after my son Sam turned 13, we were going through our usual hormonal transformations together, which is to say, sometimes the house gets crowded. Amen? Some days were great, but other days were awful. On the bad days, we sniggered impatiently and sighed and gripped our foreheads, and we argued. We argued mostly about homework and church neither of which works for Sam. But then again, neither does flossing. On this particular day, said Anne, I was driving Sam to his best friend Anthony's house where he was going to spend the night. I told Sam I would pick him up for church at 1030 the next morning. Sam was furious about having to go to church, although he only has to go every other week. All morning before we left for Anthony's house, Sam had been petulant. When I'd asked Sam to wash his breakfast dishes, you'd have thought I'd ordered him to give the kitty a flea dip. Driving to Anthony's house was one of those unbearably long 10-minute car rides. We both sighed a lot. Said Anne, when I pulled up at Anthony's house, Sam got out of the car and without saying goodbye, slammed the door and walked away. Said Anne, I blew up. Lamont continues, This is one thing they forget to mention in most child-rearing books, that at times, you'll just lose your mind. Period. So I lost it, said Anne, and I shouted for Sam to come back and get in the car. He couldn't believe his ears. He gave me a withering look that turned to desperation. No, no, please, he begged. Get in the car, I said. You do not slam the door and walk away from me. I made Sam get in the car and close the door, and I drove away. Said Anne, I parked where, where the road dead ended near Anthony's house, and I got out of the car. I said to him through the window, you will not treat me like dirt. I'm going to sit by that log over there. When you're ready to apologize with a contrite heart, you can get out of the car. I went and sat down against an ancient fallen log and smoldered. I did not look back at Sam 30 feet away. I looked at the log instead. I could feel Sam's eyes drilling into my head. Said Anne, I felt wrong and wronged. And moments later, I thought to myself, what on earth did Mary do when Jesus was 13? 
I looked over at Sam. He was staring out the car window with resigned misery. What a mess we are, I thought. But this is usually where any hope of improvement begins, acknowledging the mess. Friends, that's a great piece of wisdom to keep in mind. Sometimes the beginning of improvement is acknowledging the mess we're in. Said Anne, lying down now on the log with my eyes closed, I was still inattentive and I prayed and eventually some of my anger dissipated. After a while, I heard the car door open. I heard Sam's footsteps approach and I sat up. Said Anne, Sam sighed and began to speak. I'm sorry I was such a jerk, he said. Said Ann, I shook my head and sighed. I'm sorry I was such a jerk too. Fiat Lux, let there be light. Ann Lamott concludes, Sam needs me to listen, to be clear and fair and parental. But most of all, Sam needs me to be alive in a way that helps him feel he will be able to bear adulthood. Now, can we go back to Anthony's house? Sam asked. We got up and walked to the car. I draped my arm around his shoulders like a sweater. Friends, for many of us, our mother or a grandmother or an aunt was the one who taught us the meaning of unconditional love and forgiveness. This morning, let us give thanks for all the mothers and grandmothers, for all the women in our lives who have loved us into becoming the persons we are today. Persons who do the best we can to reflect the light of Christ's compassion, forgiveness, and love to all, family members, friends, and strangers. May the motto, Fiat Lux, let there be light, be one we embrace and celebrate as we journey to let our light shine in 2021 and beyond. Amen. Friends, now let us prepare our hearts to receive the meal that can help us do just that. Help us let our light shine. My friends, the Lord Jesus on the night of his arrest took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave this bread to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after supper, our Lord Jesus took the cup. Jesus said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink ye all of it. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you'll proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. The gifts of God for the people of God. Amen. Friends, I invite you now to take a piece of the bread that you've prepared for yourself. And let us now commune together the bread of life. Amen. And now, my friends, let us take of the cup 
the cup of forgiveness and new life. Thanks be to God. Let us drink. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, on this Mother's Day weekend, we thank you for the gift of bread and cup. And as we take this spiritual nourishment into our hearts, we feel uplifted. We feel renewed. We feel revived. We feel empowered to be instruments of your peace in this world. Thank you, O oh God, for creating us, for creating the world for creating all creatures great and small and for calling us to take care of each other, to look out for each other, to forgive, to empower, uh, to encourage each other. Thank you for this meal, which helps us continue to strive to be the best we can be. And that is one who says, here I am, Lord, send me. I'm ready to serve you. I'm ready to do my best to share your love. Thanks be to you, O God, for the gift of this simple meal with extraordinary power to transform our lives. Amen. Friends, a few years ago, the Reverend Dr. Diane Moffat, President and Executive Director of the Presbyterian Mission Agency, wrote a prayer for Mother's Day worship, and I'd like to share just a brief part of it. This morning, for our prayer, let us pray. Divine Creator, we welcome you into our sacred space. With open hearts, we usher in your presence and await the movement of your Holy Spirit. God of all mothers, stand with us as we celebrate those who have mothered, those who are mothering, and those who will mother. Walk with us as we lift up mothers who are frail and in the final season of living. Mothers who have given more than they ever received. Mothers who have cared for, caressed, and counseled us. Who have etched their mark upon our flesh. Mothers whom we grieve because they have died and their memory leaves us wanting. O oh God, comfort us as we remember mothers who are homeless and hopeless, who are locked up and locked out of their children's lives because of incarceration or mental disorders or self-imposed imprisonment that inhibits one's ability to mother. Like our earthly mothers, O oh God, you have given us life and brought us forth to be a source of life and light in this world. You have blessed us with your merciful love, even when our behavior breaks your heart. Forgive our rebellious, wayward ways. Heal our lives and the planet in which we live. As we enter the celebration of Mother's Day, make us grateful for your unwavering mercy, love, provision, patience, and guidance, and help us to share the same with others. Hear us now, O God, as we pray together, as Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, my friends, with the love of your mother in your heart, go out into this world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Honor every person. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Mm -hmm.